for somebody who has a real need to go on antibiotics and they've listened to our conversation here, they understand how powerful the microbiome is to basically every aspect of health and well-being. What would you say to them? Like, how do they go about taking that antibiotic for a good reason? Like, what can they do in the background to support going through that and afterwards to have the least detrimental impact on their microbiome? So you're exactly right. You know, we can only work to minimize our exposure to the factors that disrupt the microbiome. Uh, and so I, I call that, I, I liken the microbiome to a garden, you may recall. So we prepare the soil, get rid of the rocks and the twigs, the weeds. We plant seeds. Those are fermented foods and probiotics and the yogurts, et cetera, for other fermented foods. And then we also water and fertilize the garden. That's prebiotic fibers, polysaccharides, polyphenols. But you have to start out by minimizing your exposure to the things that disrupt the microbiome. So there's a whole list. So take an antibiotic only when truly necessary. You know, people will take a lot of antibiotics, the majority of which are not necessary. In other words, if you had an upper viral respiratory infection, you're given an antibiotic just in case it turns into a bacterial infection. That's done a lot. Or urinary tract infections are treated uh, a little bit too freely. So a lot of overuse of antibiotics. So but there's a time and place for them. You do need them at times. Uh, you want to try to choose organic foods to minimize your exposure to herbicides and pesticides. Of course, no GMOs. They're filled with glyphosate, BT toxin, and other things. Uh, filter your water, you know, chlorine, fluoride. Um, try to get off all the drugs that disrupt the microbiome, the anti-inflammatory drugs, stomach acid blocking. And by the way, it does help to have a doc who's familiar with how to do this. I do discuss ways to do that in the super gut book, but it does help when you're trying to get off, say, um, 20 years of Prilosec. It can help to have somebody do a proper assessment. Do you have stomach acid? Do you have rebound um, excess acid? There's some questions to settle before you can get off these drugs. Statin drugs are, in my view, I'm a cardiologist, I think statins are absurd. Uh, I think the data is absurd. I think the whole premise is absurd. And the whole tragedy of statin drugs to reduce cholesterol is that it took everybody's attention off the real causes of heart disease. And that's that's a real trend. That's why there's been no reduction. Even though statin drugs are used widely, there's been no meaningful reduction in cardiovascular risk. It's because if 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 you're causing heart disease and but you're treating something that's almost unrelated, well, no surprise. But anyway, so we get off those drugs. So there's a whole long list. Go back to real foods that don't have long lists of ingredients that have microbiome disruptive effects like polysorbate 80, et cetera. So there, I don't think it's possible, sadly, Jesse, to completely avoid things that screw up your microbiome. All we can do is minimize. I do have a suspicion that there are other factors that are contributing. I don't know what it is. EMF, who knows? I don't know. But I think there's more to this uh, and factors that we have not yet put our finger on. What I was getting at, though, I think you it was that's all great information. But if somebody is going to take an antibiotic, can they, you know, up the rotary? We talked about making the yogurt. Can they, you know, make a big batch of that ahead of time, take it a week leading up if, if you know, it's convenient for them to wait to start the antibiotic? Can they you know, build up the rotary or a couple of these other different species and strains that you're talking about today, either before, during, or after, to lessen the effects of those antibiotics? There are things you can do. The rotary is not very helpful in that situation because it's so susceptible to antibiotics, so it will die. And so it doesn't hurt you if you can continue to get rotary during a course of antibiotics. But things that do help, let me tell you how to make a cider. That's really helpful. So the best evidence for minimizing the damage done by antibiotics is to get a fungus called Saccharomyces boulardii, which is a cousin of Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And that's the uh, fungus everybody knows about because it is used to make wine and beer and sourdough bread and, and to make bread rise. So there's a relative, Saccharomyces boulardii, that is adapted to the human gastrointestinal tract. Well, you can buy it in North America as a product called Floristore. And it comes with, once again, low counts of Saccharomyces. So you can take the capsule and get small counts, or you can make cider and get much greater counts. It's so easy. It's foolproof. You need any 
volume. Could be a quart, could be a gallon, whatever, or liters of apple cider. It can't have any uh, preservatives in it, so no potassium sorbet, none, none of that stuff. Just plain old apples, and you want the cider, not the juice. You want that cloudy stuff. So apple cider, empty one capsule of the floor store Saccharomyces boulardii, cap it lightly, and then try to keep it at around, if possible, 80 degrees. You can use your countertop like a 70, 72 degrees, but you'll get better results at around 80, 85, maybe 90 degrees. So what I'll do is I'll put it in my oven, put the light on it, or turn the oven on to any temperature for maybe 45 seconds, just enough to warm the air and do that for 48 hours. You have to cap it lightly or vent it every so long because there's so much carbon dioxide produced. If you, if you cap it tightly, it'll, it'll explode. You can actually watch it at about 24 hours. You can see it bubbling. That's how vigorous the fermentation process is. After 48 hours, the sugar, because it starts with a lot of sugar, is reduced dramatically because the microbes consumed it. And it tastes like apple soda. It's delicious. And you drink a quarter cup a few times a day. And that is really effective for protecting yourself during a course of antibiotics. Another species you can get is a bacterial species called Lactobacillus rhamnosus GG strain. And it has to be the GG strain because the other strains of rhamnosus do not protect you. It's not as effective as this fungus. The great thing about the Saccharomyces boulardii is it's, it's not susceptible to antibiotics. So you can take, you can drink your cider or take the capsules during antibiotics and it will it'll do its job because it's unaffected by the antibiotics. The rhamnosus uh, GG can be diminished by the antibiotic, but it does help. But that's mostly effective with, during, but more so after the antibiotic. That's all really helpful. Thank you. And you talked about they're using the oven to, you know, regulate the temperature a little bit to get a better ferment. Reading your book, it sounds like you actually have a different machine, though, that you can keep a steady state temperature while you're making your yogurt. Can you talk about what that is? Yeah. You don't need that for the cider because the cider is so forgiving. But when you get into the yogurts, like all the different microbes, di different microbes have different temperature preferences. And all that means is they proliferate better at different temperatures and some die at cer certain temperatures. So Lactobacillus rotori, our favorite, likes human body temperature. So it helps to keep it around 97 to 98 Fahrenheit or around 37 Celsius. Uh, uh, there are other species, though, like like uh, Leuconostoc, likes more towards 80 degrees. What about Bacillus coagulans? It likes 115 to 122 degrees. So what really helps is if, if somebody gets into this stuff, it helps to have a, a device that allows you to alter your temperature. So some yogurt makers are like that. Some sous vides are pretty good for that, whether it's a stick sous vide or a basin sous vide, and some instant pots have a yogurt setting. Now, it always helps if you have a device with a preset temperature, you want to check the temperature with a thermometer, let it run for a little while, put it with a thermometer and see what the temperature is. Because let's say you have a yogurt maker that's preset to yogurt microbes, which is typically 108 to 114 degrees Fahrenheit. What would that be, like 39 or 40, something like that Celsius? Uh, and that kills rotori. So that's a common cause for failure. Somebody say, I tried fermenting it in my yogurt maker and all I got was soured milk. So it does help to understand the behavior of your, but I, in the super gut book, I list a bunch of brands you can consider. It shouldn't cost you much. You can get a very nice uh, yogurt maker with adjustable temperature for like $35 US. It's, it's not that expensive. If you enjoyed that clip, press here for the full episode. I'll see you over there. If people say things like, oh no, I can't eat nightshades, like eggplant or tomatoes. I can't eat FODMAPs. I can't eat anything with fructose like fruit. I can't eat legumes. Oh no.